we ordinarily do a, a whole bunch of slides and we like to walk you through a little story and kind of show the story of um, how testing really is development and how we like to go ahead and, and approach our project development from like a test driven perspective. And, and that's been, been great so far. This year we wanted to take a much more technical approach. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, the title of the talk is uh, today's Rapid Java EE Development, uh, Live Coding from Scratch to Deployment. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing is a series of live coding and some scripting and it's gonna uh, be very IDE based and um, we're gonna get through these slides real quick because I'm certain that through the rest of the week you're gonna see enough PowerPoint to wanna kill yourselves by the end of it. Um, at the very bottom here is a link. Uh, it's a bit.ly link um, with a session name. And through there, you can log on your laptops or your phones and get access to the slides that we're using here, the scripts that we're going to use. There's a blog post um, that details everything that we're doing, so you can come back to it and visit it later. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff, and I want you to be able to go through and replicate this on your own later. So we'll move right on ahead. Um, Oslock and I are writing a book along with our colleague Dan Allen, uh, who is not able to be with us today. Um, but the name of the book is Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. And the motivation behind it is that we've seen a tremendous number of books written for different spec technologies. There's books on CDI and books on EE6. There's the EGB31 book that I did a couple years back. But there's really nothing that kind of integrates everything together. We as developers want to solve problems. We want to um, address use cases. And we don't want to go through and necessarily learn all about one technology. I think it's a little bit of a fallacy to think when you read through the EE specs that uh, you're going to have an application assembler person and you're going to have a web developer person and a services developer person um, because in all the places that I've worked and for the, the customers that I go visit, it's usually the same people that are doing many roles, and EE's made that much easier through their like whole component model architecture. So we've undertaken the, the writing of this book to show how to do EE6 development um, from nothing to something out deployed. So this talk today is actually adapted from what will be the third chapter of this book, where we introduce you to a suite of technologies and we say, look, we've got a blank repo, we have a blank file system, and we're gonna take nothing and make a production web application out of it. And we've got a 60 minute session today to do it. And I'm actually a little bit concerned because I don't think it's, it's even gonna take us that long. So um, we'll get started, I suppose. We should meet some of the players that are involved because it is very difficult when you get this blank slate here and you say to yourself, how, how can I begin to start this project? How, how do you guys start a, a new project, actually? And even archives. They're cool. Any limitations? Yeah, some additional libraries that you gotta add in there. But the Maven archives are a good starting point. At least it gives you some sort of a project folder layout and a place to put things, right? Anyone else? Yeah, here's what I do, um, or what I've done for years. Um, I was on the EJB3 project. Um, I spent a long time making a POM for it, and it had a whole bunch of different configurations in there that I, I like to use. I like to configure my check style, and I like to configure my find bugs and the reporting and a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, I, every project I've made for the past three years has somehow descended from that initial file because um, I just kind of copy and paste the boilerplate and throw it all together in there. And um, there's also a good amount of Googling and um, no small amount of poking through the Maven central index to find the coordinates of whatever dependencies I need because guaranteed I'm probably gonna forget them. Um, the IDE helps out a little bit sometimes um, by suggesting you know what tendencies to put in there, but I think we can do a much better job, and, and that's what we're going to show uh, today by starting off with the next project, uh, the first project that we will see today, which is called JBoss Forge. Anyone familiar with yet? Kind of cool. What's that? I uh, will. <laughs> but the four people here can tune out and check their emails. Um, 
JBoss Forge is an incremental project building tool, um, not building from the sense that you are building your Java files into class files or assembling jars, but it's to build the project source layout uh, in and of itself. It's um, been compared a little bit to um, the tools over in the Ruby community and Rails. Um, I remember I used to go see presentations where they'd, they'd start Rails and they'd start with a project and they'd put a bunch of stuff in there and then like whiz bang boom it was done and everyone was like clapping their hands and all I could think to myself is like you just like, like you made an application that somehow mirrors your entities and your domain objects and you made like a crud database viewer. And like I don't know that like to me that had no utility as a real application or or, or anything. But I think the part that I was missing out is that it's it's a starting point and it's something that's functional. And from there you can then jumpstart that and go on into other things. So um, JBoss Forge does a lot of the same type of stuff. It's also been compared to Spring and Roo. Here's what really separates it from some of these other tools. It's not just for bootstrapping. You can take an existing project and it'll read in the configurations and intelligently mutate it in a way such that you can add entities or create view layer scaffolding from them or deploy to an application server. It's got a plug-in architecture, which means that once you've read in the project, any plugin that's conforming to the Forge SPI can go right in at runtime. And it's actually brilliantly implemented because it's a modular system. So you can bring in new plugins uh, as you're working, and they will go fetch from a repo, build them locally, install them into the current running JVM, and run because it's got this modular runtime and everything's well separated. So we're going to be using Forge to kickstart a bunch of our projects today. The Archelian test platform. Anyone familiar with this? That's nice. Very close to my heart, and the project lead of Archelian is, is sitting right next to me. Um, Archelian is a test platform that will give you the component model of Java EE, but for testing. So very simply, you can inject into your tests. You don't have to worry about starting a server or deploying into it or any of these other types of wiring bits that you normally have to do when you set up your test harness. Archelian's going to do that for you, and we'll show you what that looks like later. The idea is really just to give you something that looks and writes like a unit test, but acts as a full-scale integration test. Cool. Um, we're going to be using uh, the JBoss Developer Studio IDE. This is something that I've been hesitant to use for quite some time. Um, I do use an IDE. I use plain old Eclipse. And I never personally found the utility for all of the plugins that might be put together by JBoss Developer Studio. Um, recently discovered that there's a lot of really great stuff in here that does make your job really easy. And for the other stuff that you don't need, you just probably wouldn't use it. And it's not, you know, it's not doing you any harm to have it there. But JBoss Developer Studio is... Um, built on top of Eclipse and gives you a whole bunch of plugins all put together so you don't have to worry about the versioning between which ones. You don't have to worry about getting the correct dependencies. It's one-stop shopping for a whole bunch of tools that are really going to help you as a Java EE developer and especially a Java EE developer working with JBoss projects. So we're going to use that today and show you some of the integration points that make this whole thing really kind of seamless. Uh, finally, uh, we have the OpenShift platform. Um, for all of the mouth flapping about the cloud, it really is kind of a cool thing because we can do, we can do things now that um, used to be very expensive, impractical, and difficult even just a few years ago. Um, anyone who's familiar with OpenShift yet? Uh, we'll show you that today too. OpenShift built a tool. It's, our, it's the um, platform as a service offering from Red Hat. It's free. You go in, you sign up, you get an account, and they will give you applications. And the applications can be of many different types. They run PHP, you can run WordPress on there. There's a Drupal app, you can run plain old um, Python. And of course, uh, the Java application server, uh, JBoss AS 7.1, and JBoss Enterprise application platform. You can run that as well. Um, and it's all free, and it just becomes available online publicly. So when you think back to just a few years ago, what did it take to, to put your application on the public internet? 
you needed to probably have a server co-located, probably needed to like set it up, or you needed to pay a company like Rackspace or something similar for a dedicated machine um, because they weren't really sharing instances for Java processes the same way that they were doing for uh, PHP or some sort of like easier Apache design, right? So we're gonna be pushing off to this today too. Um, and that's about it. So um, again, if you can snap a picture of this or see the link, it's bit.ly con5458, that's today's session. And if you go log in, you can get links to everything that we're about to start talking about and follow along and push it up on your own. And uh, we're gonna have some interactive stuff as we go on later when we, when we go push this stuff live, right? So uh, I think it's time to ditch the slides and get on in there. This is the JBoss Developer Studio. For anyone who's familiar with Eclipse, looks awfully similar. We get this JBoss central view right in the middle there. And uh, it comes equipped with this Forge console. We mentioned Forge earlier. Now Forge is a shell. Okay, it's implemented as a shell. You can run it in the terminal. I generally do run it in the terminal, but recently found out um, that it's got such great integration with the IDE here that it makes little sense to run it in the terminal when I can run it right here. So you start the Forge console by pressing the green button as Zoshok's already done, and it gets us up with this shell, and if you hit enter a few times, it'll scroll down just like a normal shell does. Um, and we've got nothing, as you can see. We've got nothing in our project explorer. We've got nothing anywhere. So we're gonna start off and create a new project. We've got some canned commands that we're gonna throw in here. And this one is called new project named feedback. And we're gonna give it a top level package name. And we're gonna give it a project folder and hit enter. And Forge is gonna chug away and create the initial scaffolding in the palm for our project, as well as automatically import it for us in the project explorer. So we've got the whole structure already, and we've got a project in on the left, and we've got a POM. Kind of nice. All we did is one command, and we've got all that stuff in there for us already, right? So already we're like well ahead of the curve. Uh, there's some other things we're going to want to set up. Um, we've got a blank project, but we want to put some JPA entities in there, Java Persistence. We all use Java Persistence, or at least are willing to lie about it. Um, it'll give you a whole bunch of options for uh, installed versions and, you know, with the default to the latest release one. So we're probably going to be chugging through here and just picking most of the defaults as they go through. Um, but once that's done, you see the JPA is installed and it creates a persistence XML for you. We're going to change one of the default values from create drop to update. Create drop is going to, every time the application is deployed and undeployed, create the schema and then drop it again, you know. Um, we just want to have it updated so that we can maintain that persistence between deployments because we're going to do some fun stuff with that data later. Um, so it made us the persistence XML. It also added in these dependencies uh, into the dependency management, into the dependency section for us. So again, we don't have to put that Hibernate API stuff in there. We don't have to put the JPA entity stuff in there. It's all just right there with that one command. So that's kind of nice. Uh, we're also going to want to set up bean validation. Has anyone used bean validation yet? Bean validation 1, led by Emmanuel Bernard, came out uh, in Java EE6. And that's nice because it gives us the ability to perform, um, to, to place constraints on our entities that are going to be validated at the view layer, at the database layer, at the business logic layer, just with one declaration. So we don't have to do like as many times checking. Um, we'll show that in action later too. So we're going to first install. Uh, validation setup, and we're going to give it a, the Hibernate validator as a provider of that. And as you can see, when we go into the POM, it's going to have added this dependency section for us. So that's another thing we don't have to put in there and remember about. Yes? No, interrupt it. You're welcome. So, okay, so bean validation is a spec that will validate any managed bean. It's going to be an entity, it can be a CPI. Usually it's some sort of a user input. Um, and the validations are both canned. that They give you a series of ones that you can already use, like um, it's not null, or it's greater than this value, or it's an email address. And it's got extensible validators, too. So um, you're going to use it on anything where you're going to get user input, and you want to make sure that there's maybe a database constraint tied in at the database level, and also like a view layer constraint, so that they can't put data into the application in the first place. 
going to give you many layers of protection with just one validation. Hibernate, I mean, Hibernate will actually do that. This is Hibernate Validator. Because this is here, it will then instruct Hibernate to when it creates the schema for us, create that database constraint as well in the schema. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got most of that stuff sorted out. I know that my projects are all mirrored. Um, I'm sorry? It just adds it. Oh, um, I don't know if they're actually using anything in this. That, so here's the history there, is that uh, we've had, um, uh, at JBoss, we've had a working relationship with Sonotype, who are the guys behind Maven, and especially the Nexus repositories, and most importantly, Maven Central. Um, and we've had a relationship with them for some time, and it took us a little while to get everything all set up so that we could mirror stuff from the JBoss repository, which is where we publish things, and those things would then get mirrored automatically into Maven Central. Uh, Maven Central's got a few rules. You can't just dump anything in there. You've got to adhere to them that the um, Maven coordinates are unique and that um, the uh, repository is complete. In other words, I can't push something to Maven Central that's got dependencies on something that's not in Maven Central. Right? Maven Central's got to be a complete repository. So uh, the answer to that question is, Definitely on the onset of these projects, we needed to have JBoss Nexus involved as well. But at this point, I think for these types of things, these should all be in central, I think. And you can feel free to correct me if you find otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I can talk to you about it generically. I can't talk to you about it from a Forge perspective because it does its project generation based upon a Maven model. Um, something you can do um, if you want to go to Ant is use Maven as an intermediary. In other words, get all your dependencies in here through that. Use the dependency plugin to suck in the dependencies, output them to a lib folder or something. And then you've got them all in one place. And then you can go to Ant and make your build system however you like. Or combine Ant with Ivy, use the same coordinates, and still use the same Maven repositories backing it on the back end but use Ant as the build system, right? Or use Maven to trigger the build and then call out to Ant scripts. There are any number of ways you can, you can kind of hack this, yeah. Well, cool, we'll go on. Um, once we've got our persistence provider set up and our validation set up, um, we can go ahead and create some entities. I mean, we, right now we've got like scaffolding for a project and we've got empty folders, but we're gonna go and actually Make, make some files now and have it you know, do something. So uh, here we've now like, created an entity named feedback entity. And it's going to automatically make for us all this great stuff that makes an entity, uh, says it's serializable, has versioning involved, um, has the primary key field in there. And it's you know, just a basic scaffolding for an entity that doesn't really have anything aside from an ID. So we're going to give it some other fields. We're going to give it a field named Twitter handle. This is a feedback app, by the way. We're going to be giving feedback on this whole thing right here. So that'll be really fun at the end when we see all the hate just like on the screen. It's going to be great. Um, and we're going to hold you accountable, too, because you've got to put your Twitter handle in there. Although I'll tell you right now, we're not actually going to validate that it's real, so you're not really that accountable. Uh, we're going to put a constraint on the Twitter handle. This is what we were talking about with the bean validation. Um, this command right here, constraint command in forge, uh, we're going to say put a not null constraint on there and it's going to put the annotation on there for us so we don't have to worry about entering those eight characters all by ourselves. It's really impressive. Yeah, you guys should all stop and I can, I can take a bow and drop the mic and we can be done. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm Oh yeah, let's check this out. Okay, so we created this entity object, right? And we say forge is a shell, um, and it actually can navigate pretty well. What Oshlock's just done is he's typed ls, so it's very similar to the Unix list command. And it'll actually print out for you the fields and the methods, and you can inspect in here into feedback entry. You can also cd out of this, 
And now you're back into the model and you know, LS and see what's in there. And you can CD into the entity again and see what's there. But you don't have to go all the way out there, buddy. Yeah, that's, that's good. That every artifact that's in there is actually possible to go into and see the end and move or fields or methods. And this is kind of what we're getting at when we talk about it being uh, an incremental project building tool, right? It can, it's smart enough to be able to know at what level you are, what it's inspecting, and what commands it can operate on given the context of where you are. It's not just a simple script that generates some stuff and goes on its way and hopes it all works. Sure. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about the language of the, sh the shell language? Oh yeah, he, they made it up and no, they, they made up the commands and they wanted them to be kind of natural to anyone who's used to doing like Linux shell scripting, command line interactions. Hmm? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of commands and um, there's tab completion. So if you were to start you know what, we'll, we'll show you as we go into some of the other commands, we'll, we'll like half type them and we'll hit tab complete. It'll... There you go. Where did we leave off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, or <laughs> you can go edit the file, and then at the time you know, at the time that it inspects, is it when it reads it or when it writes it? Does it read well, it again? It will always parse up the file and understand the source that that is there, and based on what's there at the current time, it will then try to add it and see if it's been added before. So you can you can you can without any problem uh, go in and code the file yourself and then continue to use ports to add new fields to it. So that can go both ways. I'll put it this way. I've never actually thought about the logic involved. I know that I do plenty of putting stuff in the forward shell and then I go and I change quite a bit manually and I've, I've never had things fall out of sync or like come up with double not null definitions or anything like that. Of course it's actually possible to do Java abstract syntax so tree. Yeah. Um, so what do you say, buddy? We got our, is all of our entity stuff taken care of then? Almost. Okay, so um, we're building this feedback app and it's basically got this one entity in there that's called uh, feedback entry with uh, two columns. One is your Twitter handle and the other one is like a string to hold the feedback. This is gonna be a dumb, simple app. The point of this presentation is not to show you a real app or teach you anything about application design, it's to show you how to get started, get this thing running on your own machine, get it tested on your own machine, and get it pushed up and get it running in a production environment, right? So um, I think that this pretty much it does it for our, our entity model. And what we wanna do is, from this entity model, generate the scaffolding for a view layer. So uh, we do that through this scaffold setup command, and it'll ask us, um, the second we hit enter, like, do we want to install Java server faces? I'm gonna say, yeah, because Java server faces are gonna give us a whole bunch of great view stuff, and it is gonna give us the provider and put all the beautiful palm magic in place so that we don't have to do all that on our own. So by now, our palm's gotten pretty big, and we've also got a whole bunch of, like, images and icons and CSS files and other things that are involved in the scaffolding setup. even more stuff on the palm. Uh, there is one more scaffolding that we can now generate. Uh, we, we put the scaffolding up for the view layer, but we're also now going to generate the scaffolding specific um, to our entities. Um, so we do that by this command right here, which is scaffolding from entity, and it's gonna ask us if we wanna generate, like, as I said earlier, like a CRUD application for the entities, right? 
So now we've got that. And um, we should be all set. We don't have to write our own web XML. We don't have to write our faces config. At this point, we've got something that we can kind of work with. So we're going to switch over, and um, I think it's time to probably start generating some tests, because I don't like to do anything without tests. Um, we talked about Archelian a little bit before. Um, we're going to see it in a minute. But first, we talked a little bit about the plugin as well. And the plugin architecture allows us to go fetch a plugin and install it and bring it right into the runtime. And we're going to do that. We're going to install the Archelian plugin, which is going to enable us to then make Archelian tests. Um, the way this works is it goes out to the repository, it yanks a bunch of stuff, uh, pulls them down through a git checkout or a git clone, builds it locally, and installs it right into the runtime. And when it's done, it's going to give us the shell and it's going to say, hey, you're done. So now our Forge shell is equipped with Archelian, and we can issue Archelian commands on it. So we're going to say, all right, Archelian, let's uh, set this thing up. And um, I'm sorry? Uh, it's the shell. It cuts it off sometimes. Um, Archelian set up. We're going to set it up with a container of JBoss AS Remote 7. All right, so this is saying that um, we have a bunch of different type of container adapters for Archelian. There's a managed container, which will start the server for you and stop it for you. There's a remote container where it says, all right, you start it and stop it on your own. We'll just do deployment. That's what we're going to do. So, and here's a whole bunch of different containers that we can use. And as you see, that tab completion comes into play here when it shows you all the available options so you don't have to remember exactly what it is you want to put in. So we're going to set up uh, JBoss AS7. And we're going to accept the defaults for um, the Archelian bomb, which is the bill of materials bomb. We'll accept the default for JUnit, which is the latest 4.10 release. And we're going to set uh, Archelian container remote to 7.1.1 final, which is the last JBoss AS release. Um, from there, we've got Archelian in our palm. Um, all the Archelian definitions are in there. We don't have to put them in. So again, I think. A lot of the benefit is it's just not having to remember the POM dependencies, not having to remember to put stuff in dependency management as well. There's this dual config. POMs are a really, really verbose way of describing a project. And like they, they work kind of OK, but anything we can do to avoid mucking around with this, I think, is, is time well served. Um, once we've got all this thing set up, it, it might be good for us to actually generate the scaffolding for a test. Right, so instead of us making a new class and writing a new test, we can have the Archelian plugin generate a test for us. And we'll say, all right, look, based on the entity that we made, feedback entry, we'll generate, a, we'll create a test class for it, and um, we'll put it up there. And you know what we'll do? Um, we're going to come back to that test class later when we actually go and we write some real tests. For now, probably best to take this application as we have it and build it because it's. And it's a buildable project. I mean, we didn't do anything to create it. We, we interacted with the shell. But it's a buildable project. So we're going to build it. We're going to fire up a server. We're going to get it running and, and see that it's working OK, right? So we just built this you know, with Maven through the Forge shell. And um, again, we don't have the JBoss AS7 plugin yet, but that's OK. We're going to go get it. We're going to fetch the JBoss AS7 plugin. And this is going to allow us to do things like automatically download AS7 for us and start it and deploy stuff into it and stop it. Control the life cycle of AS7 so that we're not like manually going, downloading, installing, unzipping. You know, whatever keeps us in the IDE and working is going to be good for us. So we've now downloaded the plugin. We're going to set it up. Um, probably should override the JDK. It's set to 6. Um, I've been testing it with 7. Yeah. And the other defaults you can keep. So what this does here is it's going to set up AS7 for us, and it's actually going to go and download it for us. Um, that's kind of a fake download, because I've already got it in my Maven repo, so we don't have to wait for Maven Central. But it all works the same way. If we didn't already have it installed, it would go fetch it out from Maven Central. Um, so now we've got AS7 installed, we should probably 
fire it up and see what AS7 looks like when we start it. Has anyone seen, has anyone not seen AS7 start up before? It's fast. It's a full application server. And there it is, and um, done. Yeah, that took 2.2 seconds. That's a full application server. It's, it's not like lazy doing anything. It's, not, it's, it's just there. Um, and and that's, that's the level that we're at now with JBoss AS7. It's ultra fast, and it, it's going to help your productivity a whole lot, you know, and as compared to a couple of years back when, when we're all used to waiting 30 and 40 seconds for an app server to boot. Um, because we've already built our application, we're going to say AS7 deploy. And what that's going to do is going to take the, um, the application that we built here earlier. It's in target, right, under target feedback war. And it's going to deploy that war into AS7 for us. So we'll say AS7 deploy, and we'll watch it go. And since it's the first time, it's going to generate all the, um, all the database schema stuff, and Hibernate's going to do its magic, and it's going to generate the stuff for us. So when we switch over here, and we say, look at localhost, localhost 8080 says, hey, welcome to Forge. And this is the scaffolding that we talked about earlier. We generated the view scaffolding so that we can actually see an application and see what's going on. And we have this feedback ent entry, which is the scaffolding we generated from the entity. So when we go in, we talked about those two columns that we generated. We, we can actually make those two columns. So why don't we go put a little bit of data in here, and we'll say uh, Twitter handle uh, me, that's A.L. Rubinger, and my feedback is going to say, um, it's, a little, it's a little slow today. It's a little, still, still morning, and I'm not fully revved up for Java 1 quite yet. Um, and we hit create new. Actually, can I, can I add anything? Why don't we delete, let's delete the contents of the slow? We delete the contents of the slow stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, put in my handle and then leave feedback blank and hit create new. Nope, no feedback. Yeah. We talked about the bean validation before. We had some questions earlier, right? Because those fields, because of the bean validation, those fields are they're starred, right? Because the view layer knows about it, and the view layer also knows, hey, don't don't let this thing go through. We've got a validation error, and it's going to tell you what it is All along the whole path, right? No. This one right here is coming. How did he? How did he build this one? Yeah, this one. This one's going to the server and it's coming from JSF. It's not going to. The, this is an application level one, but you can actually have JavaScript validated as well, so you don't even go to the server. Yes, and like the Arai project does that too. If you've seen the Arai project, they've got. I believe the component of the JSF. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the idea behind the model is one definition for everywhere. You know, this model happens to not generate the JavaScript to, like, give it to you. It goes to the server, but it's stopping there. And on top of that, you have the database constraints as well. So there's many layers. All right, now you can put some feedback in. And I'm feeling a little more woken up at this point, I guess. So something a little more cheery, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, so we got some feedback in here. Uh, that's cool. Um, why don't we, uh, we'll, we'll shut down, we're going we're to undeploy this application by saying AS7 undeploy, and we'll visit our test script. Um, we've got to kind of speed this along a little bit. Here's scaffolding for our test script. I'm going to run you through this real quick. When we say run with Archelion at the top, that's a standard JUnit annotation. And it says, instead of the standard JUnit 4 block test runner, use our custom test runner. And it's the first thing it's going to do is it's going to hand control over to Archelion. And Archelion's go in, going to intercept the test lifecycle and be able to do whatever with it, right? And in our case, whatever is going to be say, hey, uh, connect into a server and also look for this at deployment annotation. That's one of ours. And deploy that thing into the server. 
and it's also going to be able to know what to do with these inject things, and it'll run the test method. So as we said, component model for your tests, your test should look like this. Even though it looks like a unit test, it's a full-scale integration test. It's going to interact with JBoss AS7. But this test right here is kind of, eh, it's like helpful in a show you how to do it kind of way, but not helpful in a like, let's test anything kind of way. So let's um, pull a test case. Um, we'll just change it up a little bit. And what we'll do is we'll say, um, for the deployment, instead of creating the deployment manually, we're going to pull the deployment from the one that was created in target. We're going to pull the feedback.war, and we're going to deploy that. So we're deploying the real deployment. Um, we're going to inject a persistence context into the test. So the test is going to be able to directly act uh, interact with the entity manager. And in this can find feedback by user thing, we're going to ensure that we can find uh, a feedback entry where the Twitter handle uh, is at AL Rubinger. Right? So um, why don't we make this fail first? You can change that to you or something. Yeah, that's great. Um, so remember, the server is still running, and we're using this remote adapter for our Killian, which is going to hook right into the remote thing. So all we have to do um, to get this thing going is, well, first set the Maven profile it's going to run under by right-clicking on the project, going to Maven. Yeah. Cool. And then when we go to the test case, all we have to do is right-click on it and hit Run As. J unit. Because we've designed our Killian to not rely on, there's no special plugins or anything here. This is just a standard J unit test runner. We kept the architecture to be such that you can run an our Killian test from Ant or from Maven or from any of the IDEs without any additional support. It just, if it can run J unit, it can run our Killian, right? So we're going to run this as a J unit test. And we'll see that this thing launches. And it's going to deploy into the running server and also give us our test results. Now, we see that the test is deployed in the green. One of the tests has turned green, right? So we've seen that it's deployed and we can get an entity manager. But one of our tests has failed because we're looking up a user with a Twitter handle that hasn't been put in there. So maybe we'll go into our test and actually change that up um, to put in my actual tw Twitter handle and see if we can't look me up in the database where Ashok put me in before via the web console. And now we see that it's working, right? Um, again, the whole incremental compilation thing is awesome in this regard, because we didn't have to run any build. We didn't have to do anything. All we had to do was make the change to our test file. And because of the incremental compilation in the IDE, it gets picked up. It gets shipped off here with our Killian, and the test goes. And that's just how quick your testing experience should be. You got the server running. Deploy into it. You can execute these things all day long on your local machine. Now, Granted, that's not really a test case. I wouldn't ever tell any of you that that's a valid assertion or anything like that, but it shows that, all right, we've got data in there. We can interact with it. It's a full thing. We're all on board. You're going to give me a little bit of latitude, and no one's going to come down too hard on me. Good. We've got this local app, and the local app is all well and good, but um, it would be much greater if we could make this thing publicly available, right? So we talked a little bit um, about OpenShift before. We're going to shut down this local server. We don't need it anymore. We've got this application. It's ready to go. And um, I've got an OpenShift account. And because I have an OpenShift account, I can create applications on it and provision, um, provision server instances kind of like that. And with the tooling here in JBoss uh, Developer Studio, it's really as simple as going onto the server that I've got logged in and making a new application. The name of it's called Feedback. Yep. Um, so we're going to make a new OpenShift application called Feedback. And it's going to be a JBoss AS7 type. And um, instead of creating a, a new local application for it, no, you're good. The embedded cartridges, would you let me get back to that, maybe? Thanks. Um, so we've. <laughs> We've created this, uh, this um, JBoss AS7 application on OpenShift. 
And instead of making a new project in the workspace, we're just going to hook it into the one we've got existing right here in the feedback. So we'll hit OK, and we'll hit Finish. And what this is going to do is it's going to take a little bit because it's going to interact with OpenShift on the back end. It's talking into the OpenShift servers on the cloud. It's creating the application for us. And once that application is created, it'll be provisioned and it'll be immediately available, right? Um, and it takes a couple seconds for this to happen. There's a bunch of shell scripts all calling each other, and they're cloning repos, and they're getting the, the, me the mechanics going. So while it seems like, all right, we're waiting a little while for it, you got to keep in mind that, like, you're not installing any server, you're not starting a server, you're not administering a server, you're not doing anything. It's all going to do it for you right here. And because of this JBoss Developer Studio integration, it's all kind of hooked in, and you actually get, like, a nice GUI to do it, too. Um, normally when I do this, uh, there's command line tools, so I use the command line tools for my OpenShift stuff. What do you got? Oh, that's mm. Sometimes we hit a timeout if the internet's not working quite as quickly as we want it to. Um, but as you can see here, we've now got our application open, and if you go into servers, and we right click on it and go show in a web browser. This is, our, this is our OpenShift server that we just created. You can all go there. It's, um, it's feedback-java1demo.rhcloud.com. And I'll give you, we'll give anyone who wants to go there a second to go check it out. Because in a second, we're going to push our app up there. This is the default app that comes with it. We're going to push our app up there, and it's going to be live, and we're going to throw some data into it and have some fun. That is feedback dash, minus sign, java1demo.rhcloud.com. All right. So we've got this all hooked up here. All we've got to do is publish the app that we've got here onto OpenShift. So we do that by right click and we hit publish. Yeah, so there are paid models. I mean, initially you get you get into OpenShift, and um, like it's going they're gonna give you I think what three what they call small gears, and the three small gears are um, they're 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 smaller like uh, Amazon Cloud instances, but there's also large gears that you could get for more money, and they're they're much more efficient. They have more memory, they have higher quality CPU, that kind of thing. And there's also scaling, auto-scaling as well, so that if you're under load, it'll revision more instances and go forward. Um, you okay over there? Right, okay, so we did this IDE because it's got all the integration. They're all kind of standalone things. Forge, again, is a shell, and it runs in a shell. So, I, you know, I was, until two days ago, I was running this just from the command line. I was running Forge straight from there. Um, the nice thing about this integration here is that you get to type it here and see it immediately, see all your changes immediately reflected without having to refresh or anything in the IDE. So that's kind of cool. Um, same thing with OpenShift. I mean, OpenShift is kind of Git-based. What you do is you get your repo, you pull from it, and um, you see some exceptions there. All right. We always kind of take our life in our hands when we uh, rely on like the conference internet 
to push these things up for us and hope that like Yeah, yeah, the live code's cool. Um we can try and fix this up in a second or I can keep talking, whatever. Yeah. Why don't you just make make um delete the server and just make it again? I don't need to refresh my station, but we'll just like go with it. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Well, keep in mind that, you know, I don't really want to advocate any particular technology over another that I may have a couple of years back, but it's pretty clear that Polyglot and Choice are here to stay, and that's actually at the core of some of our JBoss initiatives now. We have something called JBoss Everywhere. We have a whole bunch of guys working on our Polyglot initiative. Um, Bob McWhorter started off the TorqueBox project specifically to bring Ruby and Rails applications onto the application server. In other words, give Rails app a decent runtime. And JBoss application server with its administration and with its efficiency is a great runtime. It works out great for Rails apps. We also have Escalante, which is now uh, gonna be hosting up uh, Scala and Akka apps. We have the Immutant project uh, for Clojure. Um, recently joining us, I'm really excited to meet him actually, um, is Charles Nutter who is uh, he's the JRuby guy. You know, he's the one who's responsible for porting Ruby over to, to the JVM. So um, it's not inconsistent to say that, that JBoss is pretty committed to having the polyglot efforts aligned, um, especially from a JVM perspective. And anything that can run on the JVM, we want it to be able to run on JBoss. And we want it to be able to run on OpenShift and these types of things. So um, yeah, if you're a Ruby shop, I say, you know, go for it. Make your Ruby apps, run them on TorqueBox, have them on AS, but do be mindful of the runtime that you have. So a lot of times it used to be the argument that I would make would be that I felt that Ruby shops and script kitties were kind of not paying attention to some of the enterprise concerns that I thought were real important, like transactions and security, especially transactions. A lot of people kind of like, throw that over the wall. Look, enterprise development, we have these multi-user applications that can be accessed from anywhere. And unless you properly coordinate access to shared resources, and in particular, shared mutable state, you've got a real problem. And it's very easy to hack together an app and ignore all those things. And I feel like some of these communities have for a long time, but that's not to condemn the language and it's not to condemn the framework. It's just to say, that we need to be able to arm you with a decent runtime upon which you can run those tools. Does that seem to make sense? That's not gonna go into a whole finicky internet, folks. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> why EJB3? Well, what are you looking to do? I mean, you've got to choose the technology that's going to work out right for you. EJB may not be the leanest, meanest, greatest component model in EE anymore, but it still comes bundled with a whole bunch of services that are not standard by CDI, right? So CDI is going to give you uh, type safe injection, which is great. It's going to be a lot more extensible and in many ways more lightweight. But CDI doesn't have standardized transaction support or security. These are all add-ons, and they go in through the CDI SPI, and you can get them through the Delta Spike community or from SIEM3 add-ons. But they're, they're not spec compliant um, in that they can be guaranteed to run 
anywhere and on any server and act, you know, and work deterministically in any of those ways. So EJB still has its role. Um, if I were to look into my crystal ball or if I were to have my way, um, EJB would kind of be re-envisioned as services for EE and split off into the different component specs maybe. But use it if you like it, don't if you don't. There's still a lot of great stuff that comes with EJB. There's pooling for the stateless. There's a stateful conversation scope for the stateful beans. Message-driven beans are severely underused. They can adapt anything that's got a JCA endpoint into a listener. That means any incoming service you've got that you can write a JCA listener for, an inbound adapter, you can then receive as a transactionally safe EJB. It's an amazing thing to be able to have. Um, I'm not actually sure. I would be surprised if not, because um, the author of Forge, is Lincoln Baxter, uh, very closely working with the author of Arai, who knows quite a bit about GWT, and the author of Arai, Mike Brock, also wrote this, the scripting language called MVEL, which powers Forge. So if that conversation hasn't taken place, I would be ultra surprised. But I, don't, I haven't personally dealt with GWT, so I haven't done it on my own, actually. Go ahead. All right, OK. So. Yeah, we talked a little bit about these embedded cartridges. First of all, for this one right here, we're just using the embedded hypersonic database. Um, but there's also this like embeddable cartridge for um, MongoDB or for MySQL. And in that case, they give you a login. And you can even log in with a shell to get in there. Um, I think we're running a little low on time. We're going to have all this stuff up. Would you mind putting up the, um, the link again on the, the last slide? Thanks. We're going to put up a link again on the last slide so you can go to the blog. You can download all this stuff. We'll get the application up and running again. It's this bit.ly con5458. And I have a bunch of handouts for you guys if you want to come up here and, uh, and take a card. We've got some links. And they'll show you more about the book. And they'll link into other things like the Twitter feeds to keep you all involved and, and help you to get jump started on your own projects. Because this is really just to whet your appetite and show you what's possible. I want you to be able to go home and actually try this stuff out on your own. So. Again, good morning. Welcome to Java 1. I hope to see you uh, later and come up and, and see us, really. <laughs>